A beloved retired law enforcement officer for the city of Camden has passed away at the age of 95. L.C. Buckshot Smith served his community for over 65 years, leaving memoir. And they say memories that will last a lifetime. Channel 7's Kayla Christian joined us today with the story. Funny, fair, and loving. That's how Buckshot will be remembered in his Camden community. I love people, help people. You can't make it to heaven without loving your fellow man. Everybody knew Buckshot. Everybody. Starting his career in the 1950s, L.C. Buckshot Smith went on to become one of the oldest active serving law enforcement officers in the U.S., retiring at the age of 93. He would say this gun and this badge doesn't make the police officer. He said you've got to want to do it and you've got to try to do what's right. Buckshot served at the Washita County Sheriff's Department for 46 years and the Camden Police Department for 11, continuing his work after as a bailiff in circuit court for Judge David Graham. It's just, it was in his blood. He just loved it. He was very dedicated. Every day was a different day for him. He was polite. He always greeted you. Decades-long colleagues shared his impact in the community. Being there for everyone and trying to help people that he knew that needed help. And he was always friendly to everyone. His love, compassion, and experience that he was able to pass on to the younger officers as they came through. Um, and pretty much his heart. All hearts in agreement that he will be forever missed. It was sad. We will all miss him. It was just buckshot. When the good Lord gets ready to take me, I'm going to retire. Believed to be one of the first black law enforcement officers in his area, Buckshot also broke racial barriers and served as a role model for those who wanted to grow up and make a difference in the world like him. On your side, I'm Kayla Christian. Kayla, thank you. Details for Buckshot's memorial service. Step out of the car, keep your hands up! A tense scene outside the Lafayette Chick-fil-A in December as officers with guns drawn stop the driver of what they believe is a stolen truck. Keep your hands above your head. Face away from me. Officer Ryan Haig stops the truck and orders the driver out while Officer William Snyder places him in cuffs. In fact, Danny Brooks was a contractor for General Electric going through the drive through after work. This plate comes back as stolen. Okay. It can't be. It's my company vehicle. So what happened? Brooks's plate was identical to a stolen car out of Illinois, except for a C signifying a commercial vehicle. Brooks realizes the mistake before officers do. You have to run the C on my license plate, too. Illinois has a C if you don't run the C on it. Yep. Um, I've, I've had this issue with their plates before. LPD flock surveillance cameras and officers didn't notice the C. They also didn't realize the stolen car's plate returned to a Chevrolet Impala, not a pickup truck. The plate today sheet on this truck is the exact same plate and then C. Charles for commercial. Now Brooks is suing Lafayette Police Department. He wasn't available for comment, but News 18 interviewed his lawyers. And they could have manually typed in uh, my client's license plate and ran it manually in the squad car like they're required to do uh, through LPD policy. They didn't do that. They showed up, they pulled guns on my client, they removed him from the vehicle, put him in the back of the squad car. Good morning and welcome to the Bad Apple Report. It's 7.30 a.m. bright and early right here at home on the range. Thank you so much for being here today, folks. You know, I really, really appreciate it. I missed you guys yesterday. Um, I had a lot of yard work to do, but it wasn't just that I have to, I have to, I did. I had to upgrade my RAM. And so uh, systems a little different now working on it hopefully there's not as many jaggedy moments but hey you know you're not here to look at me you're here to see these bad apples and so let's move on we often hear from las vegas locals complaining about how they're treated in family court but judge mary perry's ongoing pattern of judicial misconduct caught the attention of the nevada commission on judicial discipline and now she's facing a public censure which is a formal statement of disapproval 
In newly published records, Judge Perry admits to multiple violations of the state code of judicial conduct, undermining public confidence that she can be fair, impartial, and properly rule on cases. The commission found that in a divorce and child custody case where the parties are not named, Judge Perry was disrespectful, using profanity and demeaning and insulting both parents. She set aside a divorce decree that had already been approved by a senior judge and refused to hear arguments about it. Recordings from the case reviewed by the commission show Judge Perry yelling and cursing at the father. She asked one of the parents, are you a psycho? That's a yes or no. Anne said, your children deserve a lot better than both of you. I'm going to take her home with me and neither one of you will see her. Regarding the son, she said, I'm surprised he's spending any time with either one of you because neither one of you are worth it at this point. It don't work. He does not want to be in the room with her. He does not want to look at her and I'm not going to force him to. What part of that is not understood? In another divorce case, the commission found Perry was hostile to one of the parties, appeared visibly agitated and angry, and refused requests to allow testimony or argument. In that case, after the divorce was settled, Judge Perry put on the record whose side she would have ruled on, saying she was doing so to prevent possible future bankruptcy fraud involving property. But the commission said she had no legal basis to do that and that her statements should have remained confidential. Although Perry admitted to improper and unprofessional conduct, she told the commission her behavior could have partly been the result of taking certain medications for health conditions that she is facing. In a statement to 13 Investigates, Perry wrote, I have gained new insight from my experience with the commission. I intend to use this experience to enhance my skills to preside over challenging cases and better serve families in our community. Perry agreed to the public censure and a 30 day suspension without pay, but that was put on hold for a year while she's on probation and undergoes remedial training. According to her bio on the district court website, Judge Perry is a veteran who served eight and a half years in the U.S. Air Force. She attended UNLV and got her law degree there too, becoming a family court judge in 2021. Her term ends January 4th. 2027. New tonight, an IMPD sergeant is sitting in the Hendricks County Jail tonight, accused of driving drunk at more than three times the legal limit. And it is not his first drunk driving arrest. Our Marina Silva has been looking into the charges against him. Marina? Well, Jenny, we just learned tonight Sergeant Peter Fakus has been charged in Hendricks County on multiple charges. But it's not the first time we here at 13 News have covered Sergeant Fakus. He was also charged and pleaded guilty on the same thing in Ohio just last year. She took my pen. Okay, I... This is body camera footage from November 2022. The man in it, IMPD Sergeant Peter Fakus, pulled over and accused of drunk driving in Ohio while off duty. A bottle of vodka found in his Jeep. What's going on? I can smell it come from your breath. I already know what's going on. Vegas pleaded guilty to OWI in March of 2023. He's since been suspended, facing termination from IMPD. Fast forward to now. Sergeant Vegas arrested again on a drunk driving charge, this time in Avon. According to court documents 13 News obtained, a Hendricks County deputy pulled Vegas over a little after 11 Thursday night here at Raceway and Broken Arrows Road. Fakus told the deputy he was, quote, eating Taco Bell, and that's why he crossed the center line. Fakus also admitted to having an expired driver's license. Court documents say Fakus refused to perform a field sobriety test and portable breathalyzer test. Fakus told the deputy it was because he was, quote, in the process of separating from IMPD. Documents say when he later had a blood draw, his blood alcohol level was 0.249, more than three times the legal limit. Investigators also say they found a half-empty bottle of vodka on the floor of his car. The arresting officer took him to the hospital because of, quote, the high level of intoxication. Fakus is now in the Hendricks County Jail without bond. stand up for myself like I had to do something to protect myself because nobody else was protecting me.
She was the only female member of the San Mateo County Sheriff's SWAT team, and now she's about to receive what could be a record settlement for a sexual harassment case, $8 million. And she's giving her first interview to the I-team's Dan Noyes, and Dan's here with us now. Dan. Well, um, and Dan, even though the county is paying that enormous amount, they are not admitting fault. There were several surprises during my interview with Corinne Barker, including the fact that she intends to keep working for the Sheriff's Department. And I went through UC Berkeley as a pre-med student and was working as an EMT at the time. 32-year-old Corinne Barker told me in this exclusive interview that she studied to be a doctor, but she became drawn to law enforcement. I had a change of heart. Um, I started doing ride-alongs, and I just loved it. I loved that you could be able to help somebody on their worst day and make it maybe just a little bit better or make them feel a little bit safer. She excelled as a San Mateo County Sheriff's deputy, receiving the department's Medal of Honor with her partner for rescuing a woman from a burning mobile home. And I was trying to hold my breath because it, it was pretty impossible to breathe, so I would come back out to take a breath and then go back in to look for her. Then Barker joined the department's SWAT team, the only female member of the unit. That was kind of my my pinnacle. That's as soon as I became a deputy, um, I knew I wanted to be on SWAT. How long before the problems started? I now see that it was almost immediate. Um, I think at the time I was very trying very hard to block it out. You know, I had worked so hard to get on that team and it was everything to me. You know, it was blood, sweat and tears that I put into it. The lawsuit against the county lists lewd comments allegedly made by her SWAT team leader, Andre Munoz, in front of other officers. Wanting to have sex with me, wanting to watch me do sexual things with other people. Barker tells me the comments were relentless and that it got physical during a training session out of town in front of other SWAT team members. He wrestled me to the ground and um, reached his hand through my leg, you know, touching private areas. I reached Andre Munoz on a cell phone last night. He hung up as soon as I said my name and referred me by text to his lawyer. Jonathan Murphy confirmed he's representing Munoz in a personnel matter, but would not go into detail and would not offer any response to Barker's lawsuit or the settlement. She told me her complaints to the county's HR department went nowhere. I really, really hoped something would come from that. And when it didn't, I was scared. Then came my Batmobile investigation. In July 2022, I reported that then Sheriff Carlos Bolanos sent a team of investigators to a garage in Indiana to recover a replica Batmobile for a friend. Andre Mignot was thought to be the leak who leaked that information. To me? Yes, <laughs> to you. Yeah. Mugno was not my source, but Bolano sent it to Internal Affairs, and Corinne Barker's sexual harassment complaints became part of that investigation. When it stalled, Barker resigned from the SWAT team and filed a lawsuit that is now being settled for $8 million. I think it gave me hope that women can stand up for themselves and be successful, that it is possible. I spoke with Corinne Barker's attorney. We were willing to settle the case for much less, uh, much earlier in the litigation before so much testimony came out. Zach Franklin tells me he began to press for a higher settlement amount after he learned that Barker's colleagues on the SWAT team stood up for her and complained about Munoz's behavior. The county denied the allegations but relented. And I think they feared, and rightfully so, that if we went to trial, a jury could return a verdict that's much bigger than $8 million. A statement from current San Mateo County Sheriff Christina Corpus depicts the harassment as incidents that occurred years ago under the previous sheriff. It says Corpus is committed to improving the culture at the department by prioritizing accountability and implementing higher standards, setting the tone that misconduct will not be tolerated under her watch. Despite the treatment she received and how her complaints were ignored, Corinne Barker wants to remain at the San Mateo County Sheriff's Department. She's now a detective focusing on homeland security. I still love this career. I still love what we stand for. But, you know, I'm, I'm the first to say that there are problems and we need to fix them. But you know that there are women out there who are like, okay, you have the settlement. Why don't you just get out of law enforcement? I think I would be abandoning who I am. You know, this, this is not just a job. 
my son is proud to say that his mom is a detective. You know, he looks up to me, and I still find a lot of meaning in the work I do. Andre Mignot was no longer working there. It appears the $8 million settlement for a single plaintiff could be a record for the state, but we can't know for sure. Many settlements are confidential, but this is definitely one of the highest amounts. The city of Pleasantville is losing its police chief and city manager next month. The two positions are done by the same man, and that has people in the Marion County town wondering what's next. WHO 13's Roger Riley went to Pleasantville to find out what's going on and how this is all possible. Hey, Roger. Yeah, hi, Janae. You know, this is the story of Joe Merstick. He started off here as the police chief, and then they asked him if he would also take on the role of city manager as well. And he spends over 60% of his time managing the city and the rest as police chief. Oh, yeah, I used to have hair when I first got this job, and I've argued with myself between the city administrator and the police chief asking the city administrator for something, and we uh, we have internal battles all the time, believe it or not. So it's kind of one of those things where um, it's a great gig to have right now, and I am so honored to, to have that, that role and in, in, in the trust within our community. But it's reached that point for me. It's, it's you know, we're doing 60 70% of city administration, and we're expected to do 60 or 70% as a police chief, and you just can't do both jobs proficiently. You know, Joe Merstick is a city administrator from his desk in the police station. From there, he may be city administrator, but he always has to be ready for the 911 call, which may require police help. He does have two other full-time officers in the department, plus two part-time officers. He attends council meetings talking about the water bills, but he could also be called out for someone needing help or some type of crime. Well, this job is definitely a small town, so yeah, I'm a working chief, and uh, Normally I have a vest on. We're required to carry a vest anytime we're out on patrol. And my cell phone uh, is available and it rings uh, all the time, even at night. So there's times that, uh, you know, you get those four or five o'clock in the morning calls that you have to respond from a dead sleep to coming out to a call, which that's what they paid me for. Now, Joe will retire from his positions in early August to spend time with his grandkids. He hopes to be able to help pick a successor for the police chief, and he does plan to stay living here in the Pleasantville area, Janae. Yeah, he deserves that after pulling double duty. All right, thanks a lot, Roger. You know, folks, the good cops that were on today's show, you know, the old guy who died too soon and the cop who retired, they didn't, you notice they didn't have the sleeve tattoos and the black ring and the, and they were remembered by their communities as absolutely impeccable, wonderful, loving people. And you know, that's a lot like my good buddy, who I haven't talked to in a long time, but he's retired now, but he was a top dog out there in California. And let's just say he was notorious, him and his crew, for going hands on, but it would be like one hand on the guy's shoulder, on the criminal's shoulder, and one hand praying for him. Yeah, him and his buddies, they were known for that. No separation of church and state, right? Whoa. Well, they were do-gooders is what they were, just like that retired cop and just like that cop that passed away. But I will say this about the girl with her $8 million now, and she's still working as a cop. If she's got a big old killer tattoo and snakes and skulls and stuff, she can take that $8 million and shove it up.